This document hasn't been updated in a while. Possible episode title, Some Asshole with Hands. Am I in the right document? It has the right episode number on it. What's good, Internet? It's Monday, August 3rd, and you're listening to Waypoint Radio episode 333. I love it. I'm your host, Rob Zachney, joined by Gita Jackson. Hello, I'm Gita. Patrick Klepek. I've got, uh, did everyone get shared on my notes for Lawnmower Man? I, I tried to share them with them. Did they... <laughs> They changed the document settings thing oh, on Google. Okay. So like, look if in. I didn't see it or if I didn't respond or if I didn't seem uh-huh. to care, uh-huh. um, it's probably just I didn't get it right or you like shared it wrong. Um, <laughs> okay. and just put it down to that. <laughs> All right, that makes um, sense. All right, I'll look into it. So if, if Rob didn't seem to care, absolutely your fault, Patrick. That's <laughs> He's suit, Stephen King's suit to get his name taken off that movie. It's remarkable. Anyway, wow. continue. Wow. Uh, and finally, returning to us from a week of... Lo-fi camping. <laughs> oh, we're not gonna let you. You know what? That's the episode Look. title. I don't care how long we go into it. Kind but, of but who's lo-fi the with the hands? I want to know. Um, hi. Yes, I was not really in the woods. I was in the suburbs, kind of, but I went into the woods a couple times. <laughs> oh, what? Wait, you were what? camping and you you were in a cabin in the suburbs? Uh, no. I, I, here's the thing. We got off on a tangent. I didn't even stay in the lo-fi cabin this time. It was just uh, the loft above oh. somebody's garage, separated garage. That's how I'm going to do When I eventually <laughs> sell this house, it's like, welcome to my cabin in the suburbs. You know? like That just seems like a cabin- cozy, way, cozy way to sell a place. Yeah, Is Cabin absolutely. in the Suburbs just the sequel to Cabin in the Woods? Right. Yes. Yeah. I never saw that's that movie. It's like, all the, the, all the it's like Vivarium, suburban but horror. <laughs> Was Vivarium good? I keep meaning to watch it. I, I like liked the Vivarium, a lot. but it doesn't quite come together in the end. But um, that's fine. Really that's fucking like great performances <laughs> and a scary good. ass concept that they they execute. They go balls in on that concept. Like, they go ah, all the way in. A, a so, horror movie doesn't come together in the end. Oops. Um, oh, no. <laughs> that's just not a, a trope of... That's not a general no. issue of horror movies Patrick at all. can't abide that. <laughs> no. Ooh, can't. Third act <laughs> problems. <laughs> um, I think it's one of the best Jesse Eisenberg performances we've seen in a while. And they really commit to this sort of play thing that they have going on. You notice a, a very quickly that they're on a set and then they make the set look even more like a set as time goes on. It's really fun. Oh, that's good. Okay. I mean, it's the, I think they just added it to Amazon Prime, so I've just been like mm. clicking past it, but um, it's When I got list. stuck in my in the quarantine in the beginning, I was like, okay, movie every day. I think I can do this. Like, I have a lot mm-hmm. of time now. And Vivarium mm-hmm. was early on in the list and it was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm making the right choice. And then I got depression. <laughs> From Bavarium? No, just just from life. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, rough. it's it's sad, uh. but you know, not just from Bavaria. Because uh, otherwise, not recommended. Yeah. Uh, certified, not fresh. Uh, gave me depression is not gave me depression. is not what I'm looking for. Uh, from, I, I'm lying, actually. That's exactly what I'm looking for from a lot of movies. Like, oh god, that fucked me up for months. Yeah, oh, best movie. The last year. movie we talked about was Stalker, Rob. I was a little surprised in terms of gave me depression. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, no uncut gems. Like, oh yeah. my god, oh, yeah, that you gave me an anxiety linger. pack and depression. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of third act problems, uh, <laughs> Kato's returned to us, and somehow we're talking about Destiny again. Uh, Gina, what's up with that? So I don't... Well, here's actually... I know exactly what happened to me. Uh-huh. Is that my friend Maddie Myers is on this podcast, Triple Clip, with two bozos named Jason and Kirk. I don't really know who those, those guys are about, <laughs> but um, my, two, my friend, dear lo- friend, you know, love of my life, Maddie Myers... She was going to be on a charity stream with the two of them and was like, oh, I need to play Destiny and I don't have anyone to play Destiny with to practice. And I was like, wait a second. What if I played Destiny? And she didn't even make it to the time that we were supposed to hang out together and play Destiny. She just kind of had a pull and fell asleep. But I started playing Destiny again just out of just like a sheer whim. And you know what? That game's perfect for the state of my brain right now because it's <laughs> all about a game where you uh, it's a game where you just you make the number bigger. And that's the whole point of the game. You collect a series of orbs and you make the number bigger. And I really, there's not much else to it but that. My boyfriend keeps asking me what Destiny is about. And I really can't tell him anything other than, well, the number gets bigger and you have to collect a lot of orbs. The- and he's watched me play and he was like, yeah, I guess you do collect a lot of orbs all the time. That's just <laughs> capitalism. 
Yeah. Oh, I was gonna Does this say, offend you? No, I was going to say the biggest orb is an egg. That's one thing you can yes, tell them exactly. about destiny. The shells coming off that egg is going to hatch. <laughs> Should I what uh, rough beast slouches toward the last city to be born? Oh my god. Uh, it's oh no. it's it's a, a perfect game to play. I found like I found my pandemic game, right? I found my game to play with my friends that are far away or in the same city, but I can't see them where I can talk while playing it. Yeah. So much of Destiny, like Destiny's lore is powerfully stupid. Like, uh, for example, <laughs> like, Kato, I got to talk to you about the Drifter because I don't understand this man who let this human shaped raccoon into the Yeah, <laughs> into yeah this fucking garbage human. I don't who fucking know it? why okay, he's allowed the, in. But someone said, yeah, you, go ahead, set up shop. Uh, probably will fucking- relate to this. But this guy, he just seems like the like you're when you're in high school, right? And you have all of you relate to this. I just know it in my heart. You have like older friends, and they have one friend who's a little bit older, and he for some reason keeps trying to convince you to drink Everclear and tells you that dip <laughs> is actually really great. He's always got a oh, water bottle full of fuck. brown spit he carries everywhere. Like that's he always that's, laughs like bah, 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 bah. that's the guy. Yeah, that's, that's the drifter, in this game now. Hundred percent. Just He's, a fucking scumbag. He calls me. Call sister. me sister all the yep. time. Like a fucking <laughs> James Charles stand. Who are you? <laughs> uh, yeah. So have they started vaulting stuff yet? Is that like, <laughs> no. are they Not shrinking yet. destiny yet? That I, is coming when Beyond Light is coming and that just got delayed, right? Yeah, so yeah. November 10th. I'm curious then, like how navigable is destiny now for somebody who's hopping in? Because like, I sort of, last time I went back to it, there were all these story quests that predate where the world is at. So, like, in the world, people would be, people would be like, oh, man, I'm still fucked up about uh, that Nathan Fillion robot. I'm so sad. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, but he's giving me, like, he's talking to me in the missions. And it started to, like, really drive home that, like, once I'd fallen off the Destiny train, it was really hard to get the vibe back. And it was really, like, sort of in your face how... um out of step, like back catalog content could feel with just the experience of playing the game. And also it was kind of fussy f- navigating through all that stuff. Um, yeah. They do a horrible job of tutorial. Yeah. You, if you've been, so if I bad. checked and I like played a little bit at launch, like three fucking years ago, I have a whole other character that's six sixty five, so that she can't even play any of the, like the, the stuff, the content that's out now. Cause she's not at that, ca- at that like, level cap yet. And, um, it it's awful. I had to like just sit down and talk to various people on Twitter and like talk to Maddie and talk to look at like a bunch of lore wikis to figure out how to play the game. Like I feel like I just <laughs> figured out what I need to do in order to progress my character. Like this weekend was when I finally figured out after playing like a lot over like a week, two weeks basically. Um where, you know, it's a easy to go through and just kind of shoot shit and have fun, though, because the really, I mean, the goal is you want that number next to your character on your on the inventory page. You just get bigger and you do that by getting loot that has bigger numbers. And so you know where to get loot, right? You do missions. But the missions all feel very scattered and random if you don't like know what quest line you're following, which they've done a very bad job at indicating to you what quest line you are following at any given time. Uh, the most like I think the best example of this was. I had no fucking idea how to, like, they have new engrams now. They have for this season of Destiny. The umbral engrams. Umbral engrams. Say that five times fast. It's difficult to say out loud to my boyfriend when I say, baby, I'm just trying to figure out how to decode my umbral engrams because I have ten of them and I don't know how to do it. Yeah, right there. You couldn't couldn't do it. You couldn't pull it off. No, I can't say it. Baby, I'm so sorry. Just give me 15 minutes because I'm just trying to decode all my umbral engrams and I don't know what to do. So close. Like, you know, I got I got an inventory full. You were only allowed to carry 10 engrams at all at all times. And I had an inventory full of umbral engrams. Mm. And the game doesn't tell you, oh, you have to do this specific quest in order to decode just these engrams. If you go to the crypt arc, it won't work. If you go to the place where you know that you can decode them because they are an umbral engram decoder, that's what the object is called. It also won't work. You have to do a specific story mission in order to get that to un- decode. Wait, I can't take my umbral engrams to the umbral engram decoder. It's behind to a, get them decoded. It's behind and a quest. The yeah, umbral the umbral decoder is the in, ability it, to use that decoder yeah. is unlocked after you do a quest. Kata, yeah. why is it like this? Because they want what they want is for the world to feel like it moves through time 
through linear time the way that we do, the way that most games don't, right? Most games have this like set span of time that they take a course over and then like you can always go back. You can always uh like it it the state of the game isn't one that changes week to week normally. Um but this is like if you're playing Destiny and keeping up with it, the idea is that the first day that the season happened, that was the only quest you could do. It was literally the only thing that there was to do if you had been keeping up. Now, the issue happens when you're a lapsed player that has other quests, old quests from previous seasons kind of hanging out. Like, they don't, they don't really, their quest system is uh, very poorly uh um organized like the the quest screen is um it's a nightmare uh, riddle of tabs and boxes that <laughs> don't make any awful. fucking sense it's and too, they're not a, you can't the, organize them even you no. can't organize them right you can't i would love to be in order of received because i like to check things off in the order that i get them you know like that's the right. kind of person that i am i can't do that they are added like, to my quest screen in a random order and then to find the quests i was tracking because you can track quests but sometimes they'll untrack themselves really useful yeah this is I the other that. thing i fucking love <laughs> it whenever you finish the step of a quest it untracks itself I hate because that. Why would you do that? I don't know. I don't oh. know. But it really, it's really one of those things that unfortunately is only really an issue when you have too many quests to take care of. And that only happens if you haven't been keeping up. Because right no, now I have like, like three quests and I know exactly where in the in the point of the quest I'm, I'm at because they're the I, same three quests that I have had for the last three weeks. And like, they're not that difficult. But like when you're new, when you're like, new and like are being given the quest from the last two and a half years of destiny 2 all at once it's fucking it becomes fucking impossible it's untenable to like actually navigate all of that but what they're hoping what they're hoping and what never happens is that you somehow figure out that what the current season stuff is right there's that season tab on there that's supposed Mm -hmm. to point you to like this is the current season Look for things with this symbol, the season symbol on it, and that's what you're supposed to be doing now. Um, it's bad. It's, it's not, bad. It's, it's buried under too many enough. menus. It it doesn't make yeah. any fucking sense. I hate it because like so many people, I feel like might who might be interested in it, just like that. I can't like per- personally shepherd through, have bounced off be- after I've given the recommendation to, to try it. Um, yeah, and been like I Truly, just can't understand. The thing <laughs> that kept me on was that this is a game that's very easy to play while you're like already kind of high and just playing video games with your right. friends. Like right. me, me, Maddie, and Nico. Now my friend Nico is also written for Waypoint. That was some great stuff. Uh, she, we, like we get together once a week and we just do like an hour of strikes. And we all fall into you know, the, the abyss when we do the jumping puzzles and laugh and we look at the things that are very pretty. That fucking tree, whatever that is, and the shadow key, the first shadow keep mission, that tree is gorgeous. That tree is so gorgeous that me and Nico just looked at it it's for a like tree. a minute and we're like, wow, instead look at of that, shooting look anything. Look at that tree. I've seen that tree yeah, once a week, tree. every week since since uh, uh, the season of Arrivals began because that's where the weekly uh, um, thing happens where you talk to Eris. And she gives oh, you yeah. like a bit of decrypted lore. Um, yeah, I, I know love Eris more. Well She's got a lot going on. <laughs> She's great. <laughs> like, She's honestly She's, one of the best characters in fucking Destiny. She really like, is. She really is. Uh, like the thing that also it's been keeping with me is that I the fans are very good at like catching you up on the story. Like if you yeah. go to Ishtar Collective and like just look at the timeline, you you can put together the pieces of where things have what things have happened since the last time you played. And that that isn't actually that hard if you care about that shit, which I right. do. Right. If you if you care to look outside of the game, though, right? Like that's the yeah, only thing. Yeah, right. It doesn't actually. That's the other thing. It gives, yeah. It gives you narrative, but it doesn't give you any. There there are other places where you can find quest guides as well, but it's definitely all this like you have to go. You really have to want it to like fucking catch up at this point, um, yeah. or have a friend who's there and can tell you just exactly what to do. Right. Like. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nightmare. It's I don't recommend getting back into Destiny, except I'm having so much fun. <laughs> I think so about it all the, the time. How long do you think you're sticking? Because uh, you know they they push back Beyond Light, but like, do you see yourself sticking with it? Uh, are you like uh, like you know we all have that moment in our lives where, in the dead spin sense of the word, it's time to become a guy. Yeah, and <laughs> we get to decide like what is our like guy identity. And uh, there are times I, think identity, I could be a destiny guy. <laughs> yes, I love it. I love it. Yeah. But like I could, I sometimes think like I would look at Kirk and Jason 
And I think about like that phase where like their their thing was there were two guys who were really into Destiny. And I thought, damn, that seems like a nice life. Just be really into Destiny. That seems like <laughs> the way to be. Like, Gita, can you imagine yourself into that life? Can you just can you Truly. have a destiny phase where it's like your garage workshop and you just go tinker? Honestly, I mean, yeah, I feel like I, I, I'm interested in what Beyond Light's going to be like. I've never played an expansion of Destiny from the beginning of it, and I'm curious about that. And, like, right now, me, and me, Maddie, and Nika are, like, enjoying just getting together as a fire team and just tooling around in the world once a week, which has been a really good, like, structured way for us to hang out. That's another thing is, like, it's kind of the perfect amount of people to chill with <laughs> when you're just, like, trying right. to shoot some guys and, like, talk shit. Me, the three of us have been having some, like, s- like stressful weeks and, like, all we want to do is shoot guys with the big guns. And, like, the other thing is they keep giving me the sickest fucking weapons. I just got a hunting bow. That shit <laughs> rocks. I love that. The bows <laughs> like, are very fucking good, which is like, yeah, great. Like, you either have to, like. The guns are also good. Yeah, I got. I'm. I'm really into hand cannons, and I've just gotten like yes. three legendary hand cannons in a row. This is very like, funny. What am I right supposed now, to do? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Is that there's a lot of hand cannons, and there's very much a sort of like when w- when will we get an exotic that's not a hand cannon again? But to a yeah. new person, the the wealth of hand cannons must seem like you know amazing because they love like, those guns. We're in the money. Great that's what I feel yeah. like every time yeah. I open yeah. up an engram and it's a hand cannon. It's like yes. Meanwhile, yes. Kata's over there like yeah. I remember when I was excited about hand cannons. <laughs> yeah, average fire uh-huh. numbers. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Were we ever so young? <laughs> Uh, that, that's the game for, just for needs me, it's to like, stop giving me sick shit. Like I, I re- last night I was like, okay, I'm gonna open up these engrams and then I'm gonna go to bed. And then I opened up the bow and I was like, well, I'm gonna be here for another 15 minutes at least. Like, yeah, shit. just shoot like, shit. <laughs> yeah, I just need to shoot some stuff in the head with that bow. And I just went to a random place, picked up some bounties, and like completed them. That's the game when it's most perfect for me, right? Where mm-hmm. you're just like, oh, I got this super sick helmet. I want to try it out right now. And then you go somewhere random, and you're like, uh, oh, Nessus is really pretty. Let's, I can do this bounty, kill 50 enemies in the next half hour. Let's do it. And then you do it, and you feel incredibly powerful. Like, this game has got the, the power fantasy figured out. We don't need to do that anymore. Like, this game yeah, it's done. makes you feel like, like the it. most. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. That's a segue opportunity, baby. I, I love it. <laughs> Power <laughs> fantasies. Speaking of like absolutely nailing those things, perhaps too well. Uh, Patrick, you've been playing Carrion uh, this this last week, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you listened. Uh, I certainly I don't. I'm not on. Absolutely not. Uh, wow. But Austin was kind of done because he was like, "It's I don't a listen to game powerful. podcasts, Kato. I can't do At it. All? I, I, I not a single one on my list. Wow. Can't do it. It is." I like I, I truly podcast? try to embrace that life of like when I when I leave this desk yeah. like I have <laughs> no I have games. left that <laughs> I would rather like I would rather listen to politics for like eight hours than like think about video games again. Pod, Pod Save America was so you take that over video game podcast? I just love no, the they Johns. got to, they were they were purged. They were purged. They got they got they <laughs> okay. were off the so they're they're off the list too. Right, right, they right, went yeah. they went they went with John Dickerson and Emily Bazelon and Shh, that's unfair Patrick. to Emily Bazelon. You know yeah, John I, might hear this. He might hear me. He might like a tweet of mine. <laughs> can't you can't we can't Patrick loves the gab fest. Uh, yeah. Gab fest. John, Patrick John loves the gab fest, John. Love the gab. You're his favorite plus gabber. member. Gab fest? <laughs> Uh, uh, so I what, what can you characterize because I don't want to like repeat right. ground so, like yeah. so of Austin's where deal Austin was landed. Carrion. Yeah. He liked it up to a point, but mm-hmm. he felt like you feel so unstoppable in that yeah. game that like it started to feel a little trivial to him. And he was like a shorter version of Carrion probably like drives. The Which is point funny because I think that game's like five hours. So, <laughs> OK, I think that's more of a like a design. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I can see where he's coming from. Um, I'm about a little where more are you halfway coming from. Uh, I love being the big fleshy monster. I uh, love eating them up. <laughs> that's the um, title. Sorry. I love role playing of as the little fleshy monster coming around the corner. You see the person in the. I posted a video on from Twitter of me playing where there's like there are the game doesn't do enough like setups with its characters. Like often you're just like running around as the big fleshy monster, and it's just like there's a couple of soldiers that can actually do damage to you, and then there's a couple of scientists, and you just kind of wreck havoc. And I think that's part of what Austin is speaking to is that if okay if you're gonna in, invoke the power fantasy, at least let, let there be some sort of like entertaining setups for the 
the the creature to engage with. And that they're like, there are hints of that at times. Like, you know, you'll come across an area where it's a bathroom and like there's someone on the shitter and there's someone else like going and like kind of washing their hands. And then like, it's funny to like, you like uh, use the analog stick, rip the door off, like take the first person, <laughs> smash them against the wall and then slowly creep up to that next door Rip open that door, turn on the invisibility settings, and then the person's just like, huh? Where, where did that flim fleshy creature go? And then and then you pound them into the wall and you eat their uh, legs. Um, that part's great. Uh, I, <laughs> it's, it's a really neat game that probably would overstay its welcome past the five hours, even as someone like me who's really, it come, brings to it a lot of, a pre, I mean, well, a lot of people like the thing that aren't necessarily into like body horror and like horror movies in general. But like, if you like the blob, like all sorts of like movies out of that uh, ilk, um, if you're sort of like seeped in that as a fandom, like carry on, like it shows such a deep kind of like reverence for that material that it is just uh, a joy to play around in that world for the, the hours that, that I am. And I think five hours seems like right about the cusp of what you could put off. Um, I, if, I think the game would have been, I wish it had a map. I don't know if Austin mentioned that. I don't find it to be a deal breaker that other people did because the game is otherwise pretty contained and linear. Um, but I think it would be better if it had one. And then the, I really like the dynamic of that you're shifting between different modes, right? So I, 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 I'm not sure if Austin explained in his summary of it, but like, you know, you can upgrade the creature, you get access to a new set of powers, but you're also, other powers are removed from your repertoire and you can't use them anymore. And so you actually need to downgrade yourself in order to access certain things. And so I, I wish there was more of that. There's like not enough of that dynamic. It would have been fun if there were, I think like multiple layers to the creature where you were like going up to a level three or a level four and you're like choosing between those. Um, again, in a certain way, it's almost like having a different build of of the character. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm really enjoying it. It seems like the issue that people have with that game, if they do have issues with it, is just a matter of depth. Where the whole vibe, like, see, the whole vibe is my shit, and I'm absolutely going to play it, even if I do, if, even if it will leave me a little bit cold, just because I'm really interested in the experience. But I do hear that just sort of, like, you end up doing a lot of the same thing. And it's, like, not a very long experience, and I don't really go very many places with that concept. Was that is that something that you've... That you've yeah, and I, and I think um, it, it's also a familiar feeling... To how I feel like wa- watching a lot of horror films. Like, how much is this like your particular shit? Like, this yeah. is my particular shit. Yeah. And it is done exceptionally well. And so I can I could sit here and I could I could explain the ways in which I think it could do more with its setup. It could do more with uh, what it's playing with. Patrick. Yeah. How would you rate the third act of Carrion? Uh, I don't know. I haven't it- gotten there yet. But I bet it, it's I, I hope it I hope it I've heard the ending is really great. Um. I imagine it involves escaping. There's like, I've gotten to a part in the story where I've like gone far, far enough outside the facility that I can see what I uh, appears to be Seattle. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but I hope I get to go. I hope my, I hope my little fleshy boy, uh, or girl, I don't know. I don't know what this, this fleshy, fleshy creature friend. is. Fleshy friend. I do know that, uh, my daughter, uh, was, uh, like if I play things around her, that uh, I'm like, mm, should you be watching this? I wait, like most of the time she's just oblivious walking around the house, just like not paying attention to what's on the TV. Um, and then eventually she turn, if she turns her eye, then I'll like have to process, mm, should this, should I continue playing this thing? Um, and she looked over and I was like, that's ah, a pixelated 2D thing. I'm not that, I'm not that uh, uh, worried about it. And then she looked and then I got shot at and she saw the creature contract. And if you get uh, all the way down to one health, you are just like this little, cute fleshy little oar with a little bit of tentacles and you just barely get around and she she looks like what happened to the monster he looks so sad he can't get around anymore oh. and i was like <laughs> i um you know there are it's often hard to tell like what influence you have on your kids how much is the environment how much is the other people around them and i was like if if i have accomplished if i can put any marker down and, and she's almost four four years of life if she has empathy for the fleshy monster on the screen. I feel like I'm doing a pretty good job. I was like, that's great. You looked at that thing and you said, I feel bad for it because it just got hurt. You know. That's good. You're a good person, lessons. Jessica. Thank you. Wednesday um, Adams was a great kid. I yeah. don't care what anybody says. Mm-hmm. She she liberated the camp full of children. It was incredible. <laughs> that second movie is pretty fucking weird. <laughs> God, the Adam winners. Family really just is a, a really great movie about a wonderful mixed race family that's doing great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
we should take a quick break there and pay some bills. I don't know what's on deck these days. I don't know what cool campaigns are running. Uh, but They're whatever it is, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. talk about Alienware, Rob. It's still Pardon? happening. Alienware is, is Alienware forever. Is still happening? It's forever. Well, you know, we've always needed a battle station. <laughs> <laughs> the more legendary, the better. <laughs> Get yours by decoding these umbral engrams today. All right, we'll take a break right now. All right, Patrick. Yeah. Um, Hmm. So, hmm. I said, like, yeah. I know your time is precious today. Um, yeah. mm. And, like, you asked that we not get into too many detours and everything. <laughs> but I'm playing F1 2020. And, uh, <laughs> wow. And I thought wow. you'd want to know, like, this I is do. the first F1 game in a while that I've been playing on my new steering wheel that I bought over the winter. Um, well, it's been interesting to watch. This is like a slight uh, related as the previews for the new flight simulator have come out. There have just been. I've just seen a lot of people doing like being in a similar boat to you. Like, all right, I've here is my moment. I'm I, I want to splurge on like some hardcore gear. So like, this was your moment for F1. It's just been interesting to watch, like, because everyone's the new flight simulator looks fucking incredible, and I want you to play it at some point because I'd, I'd be curious to hear what you thought of it. But um, it's, it's just been interesting to see a lot of people going through this moment as well of like, what do I have to buy to build a rig in my house? So in my case. I had a lot of the like raw components, right, to craft myself a rig. But I've had to confront of late the fact that the ergonomics of that that sim life just suck. Um, <laughs> like this thing, like the steering wheel is huge. It takes up the center of my desk. Um, and then I have to sort of work around it. But once I've got it all optimized the way I like and it's positioned correctly and I've got the pedals in the right place and I figured out like how to stop the pedals from sliding, it turns out if you have a yoga mat that you got because you told yourself you'd be really good about stretching and like uh-huh. taking care of your back health, but you didn't and the yoga <laughs> mat just kind of ended up tucked behind a large plant where you forgot about it and didn't like to engage with it because it reminded you of all the goals you set for yourself but didn't really deliver on. But also, well, and also because of the yeah. pandemic, it can't even be a thing when people come to your house. They're like, look, you have a yoga mat. That's a conversation starter. And yeah. you, you don't even get that from the you yoga mat. You both can't well. commiserate with someone else with having a yoga mat but never using it. Yeah, and you unroll it, or you or you pull it out, and there's like a spider web inside <laughs> of the, the center of the the roll like now. Tumbleweed like, rolls through your yoga mat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're like this feels this feels like a sign. Anyway, it turns out that is a great gripper for the pedals um, on a Logitech steering wheel, so they stop sliding around. Because otherwise, I had this problem where I'd be driving, and I'd be in a good position for driving. But the pedals would keep like sliding away from me as I'm pressing the brake. Right. And so I would just have to keep like going <laughs> leaning lower. further back. <laughs> and like eventually, like my ass isn't even on the seat. It's just my tailbone clinging to like a millimeter of chair while my foot is searching around for the brake. But like that's the only way to make it work. The yoga mat solves all that. Um, but even then, like the racing wheel has a lot of rotations in it so like you can you can set it up so that it's like a 1980s american made sedan where like Mm -hmm. you have to rotate the wheel like 12 times to get it to lock and pull into a parking space oh wow Um, you can like do that with the steering wheel but that's not really how it doesn't feel right in an f1 car where it should feel like if you crank your hands over you basically are moving all the way to like the maximum turn uh, available, so you have to fine tune all of that inside the racing game, and so there's kind of like an obnoxious like game before the game in like setting yourself up to play. Well, it's Sims. like VR. This is the yeah. exact same exact same problem like pre Oculus Quest, which is I I was a huge VR advocate. Like I truly thought um, I was truly excited for it. Like you know bought a you know uh, a Vive. Like spent you know wasn't a write off. I didn't get it like it's a press thing. I spent eight hundred bucks of my own money um, to get that full full kit with the room cameras and and all that. 
And then even after I set it up, you know, I use it a lot for like a month showing other people. And then when there'd be like a lull in new things to play with it, uh, you know, even when new stuff came out, be like, oh, all right, well, I unplugged it to make things easier to go to, go, to work. Now I got to sit and figure out, I'll, you know what, I'll just, I, uh, I'll do it in, I'll do it in another month. And then another month, another month, another month. And every time I'd set it up, you know, I'm sure I've been on this podcast, you can like mark moments where it's like a, a big VR game came out. I forced myself to set the wires up and then I played like three things and was like, oh shit, like all this cool stuff is happening. And then I unplug it and it's just like, uh, yeah, okay, back to that. I just, I, I can stare at the wires right here. I see a big one here still from Half-Life Alex because I stopped coming <laughs> down here after the... Um, after we had our, our second child, but there are still cords plugged in from me reviewing wow. that game because it happened right before all that happened. And this cord is just bothering me, and I'm going to probably unplug it after this podcast now that I've pointed it out to myself. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think this is some of the issue, like, again, to the topic of, like, being a guy, being that sort of, like, kind of, like... Lot, like a very enthusiastic hobbyist, but maybe one who doesn't have a great deal of expertise or competence. Um, I think that's kind of integral to to the whole concept. I like the idea of being like hardcore in the Sims, but yeah, the the life where like you just get really good at setting up and tearing down your your setup and like recalibrating it and getting everything. It kind of sucks, uh, and so it took me a while to get over that. Uh, and finally commit to playing F1 uh, 2020 with the the full kit. But I got to say, uh, having mostly played racing sims now on a controller for the last couple of years, with a steering wheel where I've taken the time to like set everything up properly, um, I'm just a god at this game. It's, <laughs> wow. Uh, wow. it's quite something, really. It's like, I was like, man, I, I really had felt like I'd lost a lot of like competence at these games, and I'm playing with the steering wheel, and I'm like, Oh my god, that was exquisite! I'm just exceptional. This is fantastic. <laughs> um, and it turns out the problem was not me; it was my tools. Yeah, so and pesky analog sticks. Yeah, just not yeah. enough nuance uh, available to you. There really isn't. Uh, so now, like, I'm sort of having to readjust the difficulty in F1, uh, trying to figure out like where it can be challenging to <laughs> a uh, maestro like myself. Um, <laughs> We haven't How found do, it what does that mean? What is it like? Is that just changing the aggressiveness of the AI? Is it changing the amount of uh, things that you have to manage? Like, does it make it like things are falling apart more? Like, I'm just curious. Like, what are the, yeah. where the different levers are? Oh, well, okay, all right. Continue. No, I mean, no. You 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 sort of put your finger on it. Um, there's there kind of are two levers. One is like how many of the assists do you want? Um, right. With the controller, I would generally play with like traction control. Because, like, the trigger could be just fuzzy, fussy enough with, like, using the brake or gas to, like, sort of set the car, uh, like, brake traction a little bit. So traction control will help smooth that out and make it easier to drive mm -hmm. and make it a little more fun. Uh, but, yeah, so you would leave a lot of that stuff in place for playing it with the controller. Um, and, yeah, once I moved over to, like, the steering wheel, I slowly, like, I actually really quickly started turning off all those aids because they just didn't. Not only did I not need them, but feeling them sort of kick in while I was driving with the wheel and pedals felt weird where it was like, oh, there's there's something else happening here that is not supposed to be happening. Like, I did not want to shift there uh, that 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 the the automatic transmission like was missing my shift points. So I was like, I'll do it myself. Um, but once you've got all those aids turned off, then it's really a matter of adjusting AI difficulty. And generally, the AI behaves the same way, no matter what setting it is. It's a 100-point scale. Um, what changes is just how fast, like how fast are the lap times these drivers can set, right? So like when you've got them set down at like 25% kind of, like, of their max, um, they're just turning significantly slower laps uh, than they otherwise would be. And when you turn it all the way to the max, um, I haven't tested to see how closely their lap times match what happens in reality, but like they are sort of going at full tilt um, and they will be like turning really good consistent laps that you will struggle to keep up with. Uh, and so that's kind of the phase I'm in now is like, trying to judge, trying to strike that balance between what is a fun level of challenge where I'm getting to get, have some good races during, during each uh, experience, during each session versus making it too easy for myself. 
Um, and so like, you know, where I like, where I like to be is I like to be in the mix, but not necessarily like in the hunt for the win and certainly not like easily cruising to it. Uh, so that's kind of like the moving target I'm chasing, but it's, um, it's been a lot of fun. The only thing I feel really weird about is, um, I think they dumbed the game down a little bit. Hmm. I don't think. I don't think it's for an aficionado such as me anymore. <laughs> wow. Oh, oh. God damn it. How so? You see, Rob's going to send an email to the PR person like, I have one question to send to the developers. Well, I do because like, maybe even because <laughs> to get it yeah, to your to your point uh, in the 2019 edition. A big part of the game was just adjusting the power settings on the car because they're hybrid cars now. So. They um, recover energy from braking and from the heat of their exhaust, and they use that to charge a battery up that they can then discharge for extra horsepower. And you can adjust the balance where, like, you could have it in perfect balance where as much energy as you are consuming each lap, you are regaining it. Um under braking and and at full tilt with the exhaust, or you can adjust it so that you are just burning through your battery and not really harvesting any energy because that slows the car down a little bit more because basically like you're basically engaging a lot of like um what is the way to put it like um almost like a dynamo action where you're engaging a dynamo and that is creating more friction when the car is braking because now you're basically winding up a battery um when you're doing that if you turn that off the car doesn't slow down quite as much. Uh, and it's just a little more efficient because you're not trying to wind up a battery. Um, there were like six settings for that in the 2019 edition. And it, if you really wanted to lose your mind with it, which I 100% did, you would even start like adjusting the settings at different points on the circuit so that like you'd be thinking there's a lot of hard turns in this portion of the lap. So I'm going to go to maximum recovery because I don't need the extra power, but I'll get a lot of a lot of juice off those uh, off those turns. According to the developers, drivers told them this was unrealistic and that they don't actually fuck with all these systems during a race. They just wait for their engineer to tell them on the radio when they have power they can spend and they push a button for uh, they push what's called the overtake button. And that just activates the battery and the car. It, it makes the car go fast, right? Huh. Uh, burr overtake makes the car go fast. <laughs> um, God damn it. But that may be, but I do think manipulating those systems is still part of like what contributes to F1. Yeah, that, it, it sounds like they're rub- rubbing up against where, like computerization and sort of like just like modern engineering techniques and like teamwork are changing the way like the race occurs, but is running up against what is the head cannon of like what fans want to do while they're doing the race. Um, and the similar right. way that like, you know, you think of, you know, X-Wing versus TIE Fighter and like when people talk about the arcadization of of those types of games. It's like, look, okay, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe when you're actually doing a TIE Fighter, you aren't flipping in all these nods and, and like dealing with like shield management in a way that seems like would probably be automated to some fucking degree in 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 uh, in this uh, like dogfighting. But that's that's part of it. Like that's the appeal is flipping the knob, is managing the shield. And in this case, it sounds like they may run into an issue where, well, look, it's, you know, either a computer or someone in a headset is telling you when to do this. But, you know... Uh, I guess absent them making that part of it where you like have someone that's talking to like maybe I get I can imagine like a mode like right where you had like a teammate like someone that was like informing you of that stuff while you were doing a race that could be cool I guess but I don't know it seems like you're running into an issue where the the belief of the what the sim was or or is for fans is maybe slightly different than the reality but that doesn't necessarily make it more fun for it to be quote unquote lockstep with reality yeah I I think Almost the comparison I make is some of these settings, maybe drivers don't mess with them um, directly, but I think the other element is, of this is like sports games. Yeah, you control the quarterback, you control the running back or whatever in Madden, but you also still have to call the plays, right? And if there were a Madden that came out that's like, you know, 
just hike the ball. Really call plays. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, like I would be and, like, and often aren't picking who they're throwing to either. If we're being frank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah, like the. I feel like um, the charm of any kind of simulation game is the ability to get into the nitty gritty and to fuck with tiny little settings that you might not even think about. So, like. A game like F1, I feel like, has more in common to its playership to a game like Dwarf Fortress than than a game like Madden, right? Where it's less about the fantasy of being the super sports star, more about the fantasy of I need to control every single part of this fucking car. I'm going to yeah. do it. Yeah. <laughs> I am the car, <laughs> like pretty much. <laughs> yeah, and no, yeah, that's it. I can see that being less satisfying for you if they're trying to make it more like the racing experience, but the racing experience isn't the F1 2020 experience. Yeah, and in their defense, I gotta say, like, managing all that stuff could be, like, imagine trying to play Dwarf Fortress while you're in a car going, like, 200 miles an hour. It's a little much. Yeah. Um, like, to a degree, <laughs> there were Don't there were think times, I would love that. <laughs> there were times where F1 2019 was, like, the ultimate texting and driving simulator. Because uh, oh you're just like, okay, uh, there's no cars around me, I don't think. I'm in, I'm gonna go straight for, like, like a mile here. So this is a perfect time to just really get into these menus and start. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to switch my podcast now. Uh, I don't want to listen to this. Yeah. 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 I would get terrified whenever like, um, sometimes you would have to respond to radio messages during a race to be like, uh, yeah, change the strategy we're on because like things have changed, like rain is coming in. So, uh, we should change what we're going to do. I need to confirm that message, but I need to look at what they're suggesting. And they would always piss, pick the worst time to propose these things. And like the message times out. So I would be like in the middle of like going wheel to wheel with somebody through like a series of tight corners. And that's the moment my little AI engineer is like, hey, um, when you get a chance, check out the new strategy we're proposing uh, for the rest of this race. And by the time I would no longer be at risk of like just pile driving the car into a tire barrier, um, the message would be gone and I'd end up stuck on like the shitty strategy. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it is, there are contradictory impulses uh, here, but, but I do think uh, getting to, to your point, like, I do want to be the car. I want to I want to fuck with every part of the system, even if that's not really what the person in the driver's seat would necessarily be doing. I'm not the driver. I'm the car. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. And I understand the frustration. I just also am imagining you if you were a car like a revolutionary girl or dinner right now. But that's fine. Everything's fine. Yeah. Um, what? Have you seen that move, the, an oh, the oh, anime movie? Kato, you've seen she it, right? Into a car. I've never seen Utena. I know of Utena. I know the sword. Well, in the movie, lesbians. she turns into a car. I don't know what's so difficult to understand. Okay, that's the part I didn't realize. Good to know. Now my Utena knowledge has it's, increased tenfold. It's how the patriarchy is destroyed, Kato. Okay, um, great. <laughs> you take the symbol, you, you take their most beloved symbol, and you make it lesbians. Great. And yeah. then Hell patriarchy yeah. is just owned. That's then, awesome. You know, I was thinking more like cars, the Pixar, car. the Pixar movie Cars. <laughs> I assumed that, that would you know, Rob was the, just turning into Utena Lightning cars McQueen. Crossover. <laughs> oh God! Would oh, be no. uh, Utena slash Cars. Uh, yeah, I love it. Uh, I, I don't. <laughs> um, we should probably Let's edit not this, ever do the, that. this part out. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to make some very cursed art for us. I know this in my heart. Oh God! I can't. Our wait. fans are great. <laughs> Patrick. Speaking of things that should be edited out. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get into Paper Mario. Uh, oh, I thought you were just going to talk about me. You're just like, get out of here. You're edited out of the podcast. Uh, yeah, I finished, uh, Paper, um, I finished Paper Mario, uh, the uh, Origami King. Of, uh, well, most of my thoughts are, are pretty summed up by an article I wrote last week, a few hours from from the end, um, in which um, I, I argued that uh, the Origami King is is basically a like a really wonderful adventure game uh, wrapped up in a bad JRPG. Um, and as the game goes on, and this is epitomized by um, its its final battle, um, which I won't, I won't spoil exactly what's going on, but there is, you know, you engage with its, its you know, circular combat system one last time. And uh, every time you die, it just, the, the puzzle it puts in front of you is astronomically hard. Like I laughed at it when it showed it to me. I was like, yeah, fuck you. Like, okay, I guess this is where I turn the game off and I just don't finish the origami king which would irritate me to no end as someone that 
that has to finish things. Like that's I to an irrational degree. I once I started, I want to finish it so I can just move on from it. <laughs> um, but then it turns out I DM'd a friend a friend of mine, and I was like, "The fuck at this final puzzle, man! Like this is I don't know. I this is it's as though they looked at themselves and said, Do you know what all the weaknesses of our combat system are? What if we just made a puzzle that emphasized them to the nth degree, and then put a timer on it and said, ha, 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 look at this filth we have created. Roll around in it for." approximately 45 seconds, but at five second chunks. So it's not long enough for you to understand what you're doing, but you can still be frustrated in those five second chunks. Um, they said, hey, just die. And every time you die, it just makes the puzzle a little bit easier. And so I just purposely killed myself like four or five times to the to the point where I'm not even manipulating huge parts of the puzzle. It's just lining up huge chunks. And it's just like, well, I guess I'll just move these eight chunks from right to left. And now I've solved half the puzzle. Um, mm-hmm. And it like was a real sour taste in my mouth on a game that uh, I otherwise uh, was found to be not just charming, but like actually really touching. They give a surprising emotional arc to a babam that um, <laughs> I, I would recommend people, just, if you're not going to play it, just go look it up. Go look up the... What hmm, the uh, I'm trying to figure like uh, there's a boulder. Am I gonna get depressed about a bomb? No, not depressed. It's just they give emotional interiority and um philosophical emotional direction to the life of a bomb. Um, and it's beautiful. And the way it ends is is genuinely stunning. Partially, maybe I should just I, I try I try I emailed Nintendo being like, could I please send some questions about this? And they said, what's your deadline? I said, no, I never none. Just let me ask the questions. No response. I don't think they're going to let me ask these questions about the interiority of a bomb. But um, I, yeah, it's there is this really uh, amazing uh, you know, part of the funny part of any Mario game uh, or a lot of Nintendo universes in general is just like ah, it, it just is what it is because it's whatever Nintendo wants it to be for that particular entry. You know, it makes Zelda a weird franchise because it has a quote unquote timeline that they've tried to make sense of. But the Mario series in particular is just eh, it's just whatever. Um and in this one, they give uh, like a why does a bomb exist? W- what does it do before it explodes? And what does it mean for a bomb to explode? And it's it's great. It's it's like je- it's really really fucking touching. Um, and I don't cry a lot in games. And I didn't cry at this one, but this one like tried real hard to like pull me up to the finish line in a way that I was like <laughs> not prepared for at like 11 p.m. on a Tuesday or whenever I got to this part of the game. Um, and that, that that only illustrates my frustrations with the game writ large, which is that those moments are terrific and, and amazing, and the game is full of them. Um, and then you also have to do a lot of meaningless combat. And the fact that it's ending, it just says, screw it. If you just die a bunch of times, we won't even make you actually do anything. We'll just set the puzzle solution up for you, and you can hit the A button. It probably should be revealing that the game should have gone in a different direction at a certain point. Um, and, and, and in my mind, if I could just turn off the combat except for the bosses, it would have made the game half as long, but I it probably would have been like my number one or two game of the year um, with absent that stuff because um, it's, that, it's, it's that good. So uh, just, yeah, if you play it and try and avoid the combat as much as you can, and I think you'll have a, you'll have a good time. So yeah, also Rob, I'll, li- I'll link the cutscene to you so you can. I'm nervous about it. I'm nervous. <laughs> it's like I gotta say, I have to. I'd have to rewatch it again to see how much of it makes sense without, you know, like the uh, the stuff that comes before it. Um, but I'll I'll check it out. I'm just worried you're setting me up for like a like a first 15 minutes of up type situation. But about a oh no, about. it is no, it's what yeah, it's it's it is kind of it's well, well, it's it's like a it's that similar sort of bait and switch, but one that happens like eight hours into the game. You're like, oh, I didn't know. Th- oh, I didn't know the what do we ha 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 game like what are we doing here like no like oh, okay you're gonna not do this right like this is you're this, you're using the fact that these games tend to be simple morality tales and 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 goofs and this we're just gonna sidestep this and this is all this is all a big joke right and then it's not and you have to sit with that for a little while <laughs> i'm sorry I, I wish i could yes. explain it but i don't want to ruin it for folks that haven't gotten there it's right, heartwarming yeah. it's heartwarming all right, uh, I'll send you yeah, the cutscene. You can scene, let me know because uh, I yeah I'm probably not gonna play no uh, Paper no Paper Mario. No, I've been no. I've been too busy with um you know the hottest game of the year, <laughs> Alien Isolation. Hey, you wrote you you I wrote you a really baseball. really good piece about it. So you you know unlike some of the other times where you go on your rabbit holes, like this one, you came back and you knocked out the park something. with a you wrote something. <laughs> yeah, man. Sometimes I wonder just how many like. 
just how much how much resentment is Patrick Klepek see, like just simmering <laughs> with each day during the work day where he just like looks he's like that's a take that's a take that's a take <laughs> there is that, takes that, everywhere yeah. and people there won't are. fucking write them I, was, I feel like four years of this company is me yelling at you and Austin like you guys have so many good takes and you don't write any of them down anyway you wrote this one down I did I did of course you know six years. That's pretty. That's a pretty long take gestation period. Well, yeah, but uh, that is. Um, I, I think I, I don't know if I told you this. Maybe I, told, I can't. Uh, my thought reading that was that that take would have been extremely difficult to write, even though the the arc of criticism um, and the way we write about games at launch or around their launch has changed. I think it would have been difficult for you, for you to even conceive of that piece in the midst of like an initial reaction to a game, um, and so. Being like you're a full time paid critic, where like you can just kind of fuck off and play Alien Isolation, and say I'm gonna I'm gonna spend a, d- a day writing about this, which is just not like a freelance writer couldn't do that. Like it'd be you know most places are not going to take an Alien Isolation take, no matter how good the pitch is. You know six years later, um, but that's the kind of piece that you can arrive at. You know with with some distance um, because the fact that you're playing it a second or third time or whatever. I don't know that you view those the uh, I forget the names of the the, the enemy type um, the um, what are the robots the called Joe's yeah I, I, yeah you I I think so much of Alien Isolation your initial response to it is going to be wrapped up in it's too long it's a it's a master class game that would be one of the best games of all time if it was a half or a third of the length um, and it's like hard to get past that when you're thinking about the game the first time so it was interesting to read your piece on it as someone that really did enjoy Alien Isolation and I compartmentalized it to the first half in my head um, and don't it probably actually don't replay it purely because of my problems with the second half. Yeah, it's um, I think it would have been very hard to think fully critically about it if I hadn't been able to sort of outsource figuring out the end of that game to like walkthroughs and such because yeah. there was just there were just places where I'm like, am I fucking up or is this really this stupid? And yeah. the answer is it's really that stupid, uh, right? Like there's like four times where the game is like, all right, now it's time for you to leave Sevastopol Station. And I'm like, great, I am ready to leave Sevastopol <laughs> Station. And then it does the, oh, mm, too bad. Uh, not time lose. to watch Salvation ripped away from you at the last second. And I think the most egregious is like you were literally putting on your suit to spacewalk yeah. over to the uh, transport to get you out. And you are dropped into an alien nest yet again, um, and then you just like the have ground. To- the, the, the ground just like breaks beneath you, right? Like there's nothing, you know. There's no real justification. It's just, oops, you ha- you know, ugh, you have, you know. It's a real Last of Us Part Two situation. It's like, ah. You know, the ground just sometimes, you know, gives out beneath you. It's that classic gotcha. Because of those Don't you aliens. Hate it when the ground just gives out beneath you and you just drop into an alien nest? It happens to me all the time. <laughs> it certainly does in this game. Well, that is how most of the crew of Sebastopol died, where it's like, oh, geez, not this again. Um, but, yeah, like the the last uh, three, four hours of that game at least are just an Real extended slog. end game. Uh, there's a point where you... you go and you spacewalk outside and basically adjust a satellite dish. And I swear to God, because you can only sort of clomp along in your zero G suit, it's very slow. And I think it's meant to be really like awesome because you get outside the station and you get to look at the entire thing and you sort of work with some of its equipment and it would be kind of cool, but also it dawns on you at some point that like, this is just really long. Like I've been out here (laughs) <laughs> doing these quick time like button presses on these like generators and switches for ages. Uh, and I am ready for, for this to, to wrap. Um, but I think prior to sort of that, that last act where it's all about like, we are shotgunning now parts of the alien and aliens experience into one game, whether it makes sense or not. Uh, like if I had to like choose a moment where the game kind of jumps the shark, it's where they dump you into the alien hive and you have to like set the uh, self-destruct on the station uh, to like destroy the hive. Um, the entire thing is like, OK, this is basically the the end of aliens. Uh, but this this game isn't isn't aliens uh, and it's not really built for you to be running around this like alien hive corridor 
uh, like no, because at that alien. point it would it, because it, it doesn't make the tonal shift that Alien to Aliens did, which has become an action flick, and like that's what makes Aliens work. Um, it's part of what makes it work as a sequel. And so for in Alien Isolation, part of the reason that doesn't fee, it doesn't feel right is because oh, you haven't given me any of the tools to interact. And, like this isn't how <laughs> like. At this point, someone would have picked up a gun and uh, like done, you know, or done something other than how Alien Isolation handles its first half, which is to like part of the brilliance of Alien Isolation is uh, you get to play a a smart character who would do things that would make sense in in this sort of environment, which is how not how horror movies, even Alien, which is a a brilliant one of those. And, you know, and Ripley, by and large, like acts as like a really smart uh, uh, surrogate for the for the for the viewer of someone who acts like pretty reasonable and smart in an extraordinary situation. Um, but then you get to play that out in Alien Isolation, but then you don't get in, when they switch to the, what would have been the action movie part, you get none of those tools, those verbs. And instead you're still just like hiding in closets um, and roaming around. Yeah. There's, there's a point where they give you a shotgun and they're like, now you have a shotgun. And then they give you a lot of shells for the shotgun, but then they also introduce um, working Joes that are basically wearing armor, so you can't use your little uh, EMP grenades to stun to right. stun them and knock them out. But it turns out that they die real good from like a hail of shotgun blasts, like directly to the face at like a range of six inches, and you just do that for the last part of the game where you're like walking up to dudes and like blasting them in the face of the shotgun. And it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of endless. Um, but prior to all of that, like I did just love like the slow reveal of, of just like what's going on at the station of sort of the realization, just like an alien, the game is building toward this, like you need to get and talk, get to their main, like uh, mainframe computer and ask what is going on. Right. You need to like try to send out a distress signal or whatever, uh, try to call off the, the androids. And at this sort of key point in the game, you realize that, you know, the, the entire game to this point has been about, okay, this station is basically abandoned, forgotten because the Sieg's and company that runs it is, totally ass backwards and uh, is like rapidly coming apart. But I think the thing that like resonated and this is kind of what my piece was about. The thing that resonated this time is no, like what actually fucked these people over was once again, Wayland Yutani. And in this case, it is a story of like Wayland Yutani looks at this uh, company that still has a lot of like assets, but has fallen on hard times. And it's just like, what if we just, got all of these people killed and destroyed their station uh, because there could be some, there should be, could be some good money in that. Um, and so sort of like sort of the realization at the end that at no point has like Siegson been running the show, but in fact, like it's Wayland Utani once again, like having everything go according to plan uh, did kind of strike me as a way in which uh, alien isolation was maybe a little more, in tune to what the dreads of, for lack of a better term, like late capitalism actually mm-hmm. are, where the uh, the earlier films are very much about like the decline of an industrial workforce, you know, and how industrial laborers can be treated as expendable and just like consumed by companies and discarded. Um, that kind of that all happened like 30 years ago and, and sort of progressed through the 90s. And that workforce has largely been destroyed uh, a lot. And so I'm not sure it's as resonant. Right. Like I, I do kind of wonder, even for me, um, when I look at Alien and Aliens, I see a lot of characters that remind me of my like my aunts and uncles. Yeah. Um, but not a lot of people that remind me of like my friends, right? Because just our precarity looks different. It isn't talking to your supervisor and be like, Hey dude, where's my bonus pay? Contract says I get bonus pay. Uh, the, the notion of having a contract that says I get bonus pay <laughs> or, or is overtime. like remarkable. What? I said, or overtime. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that I really did appreciate how like alien isolation kind of says, well, how do you square what people's experience of being a precarious and disposable worker now? Uh, how does that map to how can you make that map to the alien uh, universe? And the answer is Wayland Utani as like a 
uh, corporate raider in some ways where, you know, they have they have assets, they have money in the bank, they have lines of credit and they can just take struggling businesses and like chop them up for parts and buy the alien. Like in this case, literally, right? Like literally you're taking a company and its entire workforce and just letting the, them get like brutally vivisected by uh, by the thing the company is trying to hatch. And I thought that was a really smart and resonant approach that I'm not sure I would have seen as clearly in 2014, right? But uh, in 2020, as like businesses are getting bought, bought out like right and left uh, because they just can't sustain operating uh, through the COVID shutdowns. Um, it's like, yeah, this is this 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 game was actually maybe even a little bit ahead of its time. Not that private equity raids like this are new, uh, but certainly now it feels like literally every day you're opening the paper and it's like, oh, another huge workforce is endangered because their company got in trouble and somebody was just able to buy them. And now there's like nothing they can do. Um, so it, it was. I I was surprised how smart the game was. Uh, in addition to being a really like, really good uh, rendition of Alien, dude. Like it just well, and my, and I my guess is you could probably also spend more time in that reading because playing it again, there's a little bit less of the fear factor. Like I'm sure it's still effective as a game, but you know what I mean. Like you're spending so much that time the first time through just scared out of your mind. Like it, it what's so remarkable about the game is that it, it manages to uh, make a creature that like, yeah, there's see, see, the reason alien to aliens works so well is because it acknowledges what most horror doesn't, which is that cool. You've seen it once, like really hard to like, there's a reason that the rubber suit stays behind in the dark in the first one for as long as it does. Partially is because it was a pretty crummy looking rubber suit. <laughs> the other part was because once you see that thing, your the imagination is no longer doing all the work for you. Like it's not scary anymore. And alien solves it by making it a, a hive swarm. And, uh, what was remarkable about Isolation was, which none of the sequels to any of the uh, uh, Alien movies have have done to any measure of success, is like make that creature scary again. And and part of that is the brilliance of the world they set up. And part of that's just that by making it interactive, it, it you know, you could have replaced the alien, the xenomorph or whatever you want to call it with a, a number of other things. And the basic setup they have there would have been terrifying regardless. I think but part of the reason Isolation worked is because it like took me back to the first time I saw alien and like my imagination took over again in a way that a movie can't do anymore because that format is just like doesn't work for that presentation or at least making it scary and isolation able to be able to recontextualize it in a way that yeah man what a fuck and just smart touches like the fact that the directional sound is pretty good but the thing that you can never localize very well is the sound of the alien moving in the ducts (laughs) <laughs> and yeah. so like once it comes out of the ducks, you can hear it like, oh, it's off to my left. It's off to my right, yep. whatever. But when it's in the ducks, that thing could be like right behind you or it could be, you know, across the map. It's just like and so you end up like you, everywhere you're going, you are constantly like you start scaring yourself. Right. Like which is part of successful horror is suddenly the monster may not even be there, but you're just looking down a hallway and you're like, I would do anything if I did not have to walk down this hallway. Like, it would be <laughs> great if that were not the if my destination were not this lit room at the end of this dark hallway. Um, that would be great. Uh, there was this point where you're on a section of the station that they're trying to basically detach from the station. They're like trying to lure the alien onto something. They're going to blow off into space. Um and there is this this part where like you have to uh, pressurize an airlock, and so you know what's you know what's going to happen. You you go and mm-hmm. you start the pressurization, and <laughs> uh-huh. it's like five percent airlock pressure <laughs> rising, and then you hear the like little, tss, and then the thing is down there with you, and like you're just constantly like you don't want to leave this airlock door because you're like mm-hmm. I need to get the fuck out of here as quickly as possible, but also you can't hang out there, and so you're just desperately trying to be like, how do I get this thing away from this door I need to use? Um, and playing this like fucked up game of cat and mouse. Yeah, it's um also yeah. just the work like the the way that other properties have treated 
Okay, so looking at his at the, at the traditional alien design, it's no longer scary. What do we do? But like, what if it was a dog? And like, I mean, because they did that. Like, there's an alien dog hybrid that it was actually in the movie. I think it was in in the movies at some point. But like, it's always just what what about a different fucking alien? And part of what makes isolation work is they kept it to just the one creature, and then found something else in that universe to scare. It's like the working Joes are are terrifying like the yeah. first time you encounter them. And like, that's another one of like, what makes that game so smart is like, oh, th- the way to make this scary is to, is not just to add different types of aliens. It's actually to find something else in the environment that would unnerve you in, in the same way. And that's part of what makes that like design idea work so well, um, you know, at least for, for, for a part of the game. I think, Something I would like to have seen in that game, I think I would say this about a lot of immersive sims, is the fact that they don't have um, options to have the game set up where not everything is immediately hostile to you. Uh, I really love the part of the game where the working Joes are like, they haven't totally gone evil yet. They're, I mean, they're clearly bad news, but they're like <laughs> really shitty butlers who like can't and won't help you and will clearly murder you like at the drop of a dime. But early on when you first meet them, they're like, can I help you? <laughs> Would you like to know about our safety protocols? But that's that's what's great. Like it's it's a you know, you know where this is going. Yeah. Like if there's a great sense of foreboding about like they 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 introduce the same arc for the alien, but for a different, like, you know, enemy type where it's like, ah, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, that's going to get fucked at oh, some that point. Th- that thing is staring at me. And yeah. I don't like that. Me, maybe. Yeah. That. Yeah. And I think there could have been more of that in the game, right? Where it's like, so are these androids like going to kill me or are they still programmed to just be doing their jobs? And they can turn on a dime. I think that uncertainty would have been a lot of fun. Um, and I think this is something that we run into a lot with just immersive sims where the entire thing is set up for you to be completely alone in a hostile environment. Um, but maybe only Dishonored really like even suggests that there's kind of a semi normal world uh, that can unfold at times. Um, but either way. Um, yeah. Like two thirds of just an all timer, Patrick. Like, yeah, it's so good. It's so good. I remember I remember when I was reviewing that for Giant Bomb and my wife was like, hey, are we going to go to this thing tonight? Some friend thing. I was like, yeah, yeah. Like, well, just give me. I was like, this seems like a solid 90 minutes. I was like, I'll be done. We'll get in the cab. We'll go to the thing. She came down. Like, it was patient. Like, gave me a full two hours. And I was like, hey. And I was like, I'm not. It's, I don't think I'm anywhere close to done. She's like, turn it off. I was like, all right. <laughs> it was like, of course, another three hours before I, I actually got uh, to the end, uh, I was looking because uh, I knew that Creative Assembly was they're not working on a sequel to this, which is fine. I, 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 it's part of what makes it so all the more frustrating is that if it was half of the game, it would be a masterpiece that was like infinitely replayable, and I wouldn't want a sequel. It's like part of the reason I even wanted them to make another one was like, ah, like what if like you took you took this and like just like honed a little bit better. But the same team that worked on that is they haven't announced what they're working on, but it's uh, a tactical first person shooter. I'm, I'm like curious what that would mean. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I can't imagine that they would like totally go away from like the immersive sim com- completely. But like I'm I'm glad they created assembly because that game so much the core of it was so good that I. I'm actually excited that they're working on a non-alien or likely a non-alien property, but I'm I'm very curious to see like what does that team learn from this because at this point it's been a full Wait, tactical six shooter. years. Um, alien. Clone yeah, I don't know. That like, tactical two. shooter could mean fucking anything. Um, Rainbow Six, uh, but with the alien. Sh- Colonial yeah, Marines. If they decided two. to make aliens. If they just decided it's like, yeah, yes, Rob. <laughs> actually, maybe they should make another game of the Alien universe. <laughs> Oh, um, just last thing I'll call out uh, Will Porter who was one of the writers on the game did mention that um, my interpretation was it was like okay this is clearly a thing about the anxieties of tech workers funny thing Will Porter says that uh, his portrayal of Seeks and was actually based on his experiences in the media industry uh, which does track <laughs> maybe that's another reason why this was so resonant of like a fucked up company where everyone's like 
we are not going to invest anything in your product, but we're going to demand some major results uh, or there's or bad things will happen. Um, and with that reading, I'm like, yeah, Seekson, definitely uh, a, a media company by by those lights. Um, anyway, that's it for for me for this week. Anyone else got anything else they want to hit before uh, before we call it? Uh, I now no, currently own no. 278 <laughs> peanuts in blaze ball oh you can buy good. peanuts now and That's when you, that good when you know. when you run out of money you can beg the gods for more money and then you can oh, use that you money peanuts? to buy more peanuts we probably should disclose I like literally just found out about this. <laughs> Weird that no one told us. But Friends in the Table is sponsoring the next couple of seasons of Blaze Ball. No, yeah, that's that amazing. makes sense that okay. Austin would do that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. I mean, okay. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> like, whatever. Well, that's that. <laughs> uh,. All right, well, that will do it for this week's show. Uh, you can send questions to gaming at vice.com with a subject question. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Rob Zachney. Patrick, where can people find you? At Patrick Klopik. Gita. At XOXO Gossip Gita. Kato. Buy a peanut, beg the gods. <laughs> Buy a you can follow peanut, Waypoint at gods. Waypoint on Twitter uh, and you can Buy keep up with what we're Beg the gods. What kettle? Buy a peanut. Beg the gods. Okay. Um, does he get more peanuts if he does this on the podcast? Is this like part? Like, is this like an unspoken? Like, who who knows now in this uh, in, in this um, cross brand synergistic tie in world of Blazeball uh, that we live in now? Who knows uh, what what the rules are? Um, the opening track is Miss You by Bowen off the EP Pale Machine. You can learn more at waypoint.zone slash Bowen. And you can chat uh, with us on our forums at discourse.zone. Uh, but that will do it for this week. Uh, in the meantime, do not give in to astonishment. It is just such a it's such a joy to control. It truly is like, a, is there like a? I'm gonna pause for a second. Is it like a scratching that's occurring? Yeah, I is can anyone hear else hearing that. Too. There's like a no. <laughs> Weird. Okay. Well, I was buffing my nails, but anyway. Oh, sorry. I don't <laughs> Usually, it doesn't come up on the mic because the mic is so dramatic. It was extremely on the mic. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, cool. The thing that I do to keep myself from typing on this podcast is paint my nails. Oh, because I my, gotcha. my okay. My keyboard is really loud, so now I'm gonna have to find a different thing to do. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, or we can find like a, a way to uh, hard mute your mic. I do that on mine, settings so that you can get that. Like, it was fine, and there were it. Oh my god, it raised the gain on its there own. There you go. There we go. Cool. Was I on a Google? I must have been. Anyway, I hate technology. Anyway, I'm so sorry. No, you no big deal. I just. Spinner. I think is what we, so my therapist <laughs> I, had a fidget spinner me. in his office back when I went to the office and I was like, I don't need a fidget spinner, but it turns out I did. And <laughs> I, was like, I need is, one of those. This is my life now. The fidget cubes that, that you can oh, the click little clicky on. ones. Yeah. Yeah. Like the clicky, for some reason, the clicky is the thing for me. Lo-fi? Yeah, what's, Whoa, what, what, I what mean, makes certain, a lo-fi cabin? Oh, I, ah, I will say, uh, my, my hi-fi. <laughs> I will it's say, like you open the door, raccoons come running out, and you're like, mm, "No, this is I that lo-fi shit. I it's raw." Mean, I guess I mean lo-fi in the <laughs> in in relation to other Airbnbs, right? Like people have certain expectations yeah, right. when they yeah, have yeah, an Airbnb, like an Airbnb. You expect Airbnb. to be like. Yo, here's the 5G. Exactly. Yeah, well, cabin exactly. cabin rentals are just a different. Like the minute you're like, I want a cabin, you're signing up for like. Things that are like two generations of hand-me-down furniture uh -huh. and so, yeah, lots of dubious yeah. uh, decisions. You're just hoping for like a minimal amount of bed bugs. <laughs> well, Jesus let's not Christ. go crazy. Don't Patrick. even. I don't, don't know. Even, like you can't. I don't know joke. what your cabin setup is. You can't joke about bed bugs.
You really I've can't joke about that. Experience. I've had them. I know they're terrible. I've had Two them. New Yorkers <laughs> in this chat. You cannot joke about that. I've had them. Don't don't. Just because I moved to the suburbs ain't like I didn't live in the city for fifteen years. Like I ha- I've had the bed bugs. Oh, there, but uh, for the grace of God, go I. Uh, literally, the first day we were in this place, we had a bed bug scare. It turned out yeah, to not God. be a bed bug, but for our a, first a, a full, like three hours. Bugs. Yeah. yeah our, our first apartment in San Francisco, we had them. We had to set tape on the ground to prove they where they were coming from so that our landlord would um, do something about oh, it. Jesus Christ. Because, like, I don't know if they're bed bugs. It's like, no, I'm pretty. It's pretty fucking pretty sure they're bed bugs. Yeah. So I p- fucking prove it. And I was like, <laughs> so I looked up on the internet and it was like, lay down double sided tape so that they get stuck to the tape and you can prove. Because we knew they weren't coming from our our place. We knew yeah. they were coming from somewhere else. And so yeah. to like, you know, in, go invasive and fumigate someone else's place, they were like, prove it. I was like, all right, it's that motherfucker. <laughs> Come from that closet <laughs> and I can show you the path. Yeah. Wow. Great. Wait, All right, one um, second. Let me grab something from my other room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. We'll pull so up. So in terms items. of discussion order, uh, I don't know. To honor Kato's return, maybe we just dive into the Destiny stuff. Uh, <laughs> speaking of returns, we're back in Destiny. Yeah. Um, Destiny's back. And then, back. Patrick, uh, we can discuss Carrion a little bit. We can take a break. Uh, do Paper Mario, and then I hold you hostage for Alien. Okay, let's just uh, if if we're gonna if we're gonna front load Destiny, and, and that thus you're now holding me for the whole podcast. We have to be uh, just mindful of the time. Then. Sup? Um, yeah, that's I'm, I'm fine I'm with not that. Not mindful of the time, Patrick. <laughs> you, <laughs> what's, what's this? You about? want to explain to Emmanuel why the accessibility <laughs> feature is pushed back an additional two days? I'm Emmanuel. I'm, I want loves put, our podcast. Se- I, I, I am rec- more. Kind of was the backup running. Um, yeah, let's, no, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Emmanuel is like, give me more podcasts, give me more Patrick Klopik on that podcast. I don't care about deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck Deathsmith. That's what Emmanuel said to me before uh before we potted. Wow. All right. Uh time dot is. Everybody open up time dot is. Who is this Emmanuel you spoke to and what did he do with the real Emmanuel? Yeah. His his name is Eggberg now. <laughs> <laughs> My brother Eggberg. Uh, <laughs> the way you said that. Yeah, there wasn't even a joke. It was just the way you said it was. Uh, <laughs> Hello, I am Ed- Eggberg. Eggberg here today. I'm not sure what that it's voice like is the, either. Emmanuel, I was like the trailer for American Pickle, where Emmanuel Eggberg suggests his Jewish ancestors come back to shame him. Uh, everyone got time to ask? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Rob. All right. Let's go at 45. Okay. Perfect. Clay ups. All right. <laughs>